Welcome to Leary Talks. My name is Katrien Maas. I'm Special Initiatives Ambassador for the League of European Research Universities and your moderator today. Connecting the worlds of universities and science policy makers is at the heart of what Leary has been doing for more than 20 years. An outspoken voice on education, research and innovation. With Leary Talks, we are bringing this interaction to a wide audience within and outside the universities, but also to citizens, politicians, policymakers in Europe and beyond. Today, we turn to the topic of science diplomacy. It is timely because of the current geopolitical environment, of course, and because of initiatives at the EU level. Definitely the right time for us to have a discussion with an academic and a policymaker. It's my pleasure to introduce our two guests here in the studio. Welcome, Ms. Maria Cristina Russo, Director, International Cooperation, Research and Innovation at the European Commission. Thank you very much, Katrin. Very pleased to be here. Great. And also, of course, Dr. Jean-Christophe Maudouy, Lecturer in Science Diplomacy at the University College London, which is, of course, a Leary member university. <laughs> Thank you, Katrin. It's a pleasure to be here as well. Okay, great. Let's start. We'll start off with the first question to you, JC. What about science diplomacy? Is it different? What makes it unique from other kinds uh, or distinct from other kinds of diplomacy? Right. Well, uh, first, I think it's important to note that uh, science diplomacy as a term, as a concept, has recently emerged. Uh, in part to describe, indeed, a distinct form of, of diplomacy. Uh, one that has uh, a unique focus on science. Um, and I think it's in part because uh, in the 21st century, we see the, the rise of global challenges that are underpinned by uh, science, technology, innovation issues. Um, we can think about climate change, disruptive technologies, um, economic growth that is increasingly driven by, by science, or the need for um, ever larger uh, scientific instruments which require international mm -hmm. collaborations. Um, so science diplomacy has really carved its, its uh, space alongside uh, these, these other forms of, uh, of diplomacy. Uh, I, I think just to be fair, uh, we shouldn't really try to partition things too much. Mm. Um, science is part of the cultural landscape of a nation, uh, as such pertains to cultural uh, diplomacy. The scientific prestige uh, of mm. science is also uh, public diplomacy and mm. uh, the technology and innovation side of science is part of the economic diplomacy. So it's not easy to, to fully uh, partition that. So for me, just one last note maybe is that diplomacy itself, when we think about the term, we always uh, default to the traditional understanding uh, or definition of diplomacy as led by states. Um, and I think mm -hmm. in our in our multipolar world uh, today, we see that there are a number of other actors, non-state actors that are engaged mm -hmm. in science diplomacy mm -hmm. more and more. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely uh, true. There's a lot of already there, Christina. What is your response to that? But yes, indeed. Uh, very briefly, I think that uh, indeed science diplomacy is unique uh, because it's cross-cutting. You know, we spoke about uh, cultural diplomacy, climate diplomacy, digital diplomacy, and in reality, science diplomacy underpins mm -hmm. all uh, of uh, those other forms of, uh, of diplomacy because they are based on scientific evidence. And also what I would like to highlight is that uh, uh, science diplomacy is based on the values of science, mm. which are universal values. And this is uh, what makes it unique. And this is what uh, we in the European Commission have underlined in our strategy for international cooperation in, in research and innovation, the global approach to mm -hmm. research and innovation, which highlights uh, science diplomacy as one key element of our international cooperation strategy and links it uh, to this uh, multilateral dialogue that uh, we have initiated in the European Commission with uh, in the countries outside Europe with which we have science mm. and technology agreements or which are associated to our program in order to work together on those uh, universal values uh, mm -hmm. of uh, science uh, which are at the heart of science diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So values are very important. Global challenges, multipolar world. Uh, Christina, next question. Mm, can you give an exact 
more precise practical example of how science diplomacy puts this value into practice. Yes, yes, I could give uh, many yeah. throughout all my years <laughs> as director for international cooperation. But uh, I think uh, that uh, um, one one example that uh, that I would like to to give about uh, the the way that uh, that science uh, uh, is uh, uh, important uh, to 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 overcome political hurdles and also to 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 promote the values is for example uh, the um, the agreement that i negotiated for the association of morocco to mm. prima prima is the partnership mm. for research and innovation in the mediterranean area and uh, i have negotiated mm. several agreements in order to associate third countries from the south med to this mm. initiative and uh, the one for morocco was signed in 2018 and uh, it was really important uh, how we found uh, a common basis uh, based on the values and the importance of mm. science uh, to overcome mm. uh, those uh, important geopolitical issues that uh, at time would have prevented mm. Morocco to sign this agreement. Mm -hmm. Now I'm negotiating a second one. I hope it will still yes. work. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I hope so too. JC, well, what would you say? Practical example. Right. So like Christina, I would it's it's hard to limit oneself mm. to just one example. Mm. It wouldn't really illustrate the breadth of, mm. of science diplomacy. Uh, I think one thing that I want to highlight first is that when we talk about impact or uh, you know decisive impact of science diplomacy, practical example, it's um, it depends what we're what what scales we're talking about. Is it local? Is it national? Mm. Is it international? Is it all of that? So uh, you know, it depends on. Uh, on which lens you you, you put mm. on on uh, um, uh, on the action of science diplomacy, but maybe as a very very simple, very practical example, um, something that Mexican diplomats shared with me uh, during my time in the U.S. Uh, they had an issue with uh, shrimp farmers that saw their stock dying in the state of Sinaloa, and they didn't know why it, it was the case. And it's through the diplomatic network of Mexico in the U.S. that they connected. Um, and these, these farmers in these communities mm. with uh, uh, scientists of the scientific diaspora, but also uh, U.S. scientists, and together they were able to solve the problem mm -hmm. and the community recovered economically. Mm -hmm. So that had an impact locally in, mm -hmm. in the region. Um, one thing that I want to just say also is that we tend to construe science diplomacy as a, you know, always mm. a positive lens on it, but mm. they are negative impacts also that can can happen so uh, we we can see um, where for example international scientific collaboration is not allowed uh, mm -hmm. by state so we can cite the example in 2011 of the us um, decided to stop international uh, collaboration in space with china mm -hmm. for example there are many other uh, uh, examples finally i think the international impact for me mm -hmm. i want to put uh, just uh, uh, the the light on non-state actors and here I would like to to highlight the Pugwash conferences, mm -hmm. and those are conferences that were uh, groups of scientists after World War II, uh, after the 1955 Brussels Einstein Manifesto, um, warning about the nuclear the danger of nuclear weapons, and they met together through these conferences, and these groups of scientists are informally credited to for many of the uh, international treaties around weapons and nuclear disarmament and so on. Um, so I think that showcases really also the, the way that non-state actors can have an impact, international impact mm -hmm. in science diplomacy. That said, mm. states are always behind somehow also, mm -hmm. and it's, it, there's an entanglement, mm -hmm. so it's never simple. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, and there's a question of individuals versus companies also. There are many actors yes. in this space, and maybe we'll talk yeah. about that later. But for now, I'd like to go to our, our next question, because you already sort of said there are negatives as well, mm -hmm. but there are also problems, challenges for science diplomacy. And in the past, those have made, been made uh, quite uh, clear, uh, different national approaches, different strategies, lack of coordination, lack of strategy, even that universities are 
largely absent as an actor on this. I don't know whether you agree with this, but uh, it was something that was said at a Leary Rector's Assembly conference by an authority on um, science diplomacy that you probably know, Professor Luc van Langenhove. Uh, so that's something that we could talk about uh, as well. But w what do you identify as uh, the, the main challenges? And I would like, uh, Christina, how do you react to that? What do you see? Yeah, I mean, uh, indeed, there are in enormous challenges, uh, but mm. there are also great opportunities, uh, because I think that uh, for me, the biggest challenge is that uh, the, we don't act together as uh, as EU, as, uh, as, uh, as European Union, and that we have uh, different uh, approaches and the uncoordinated approach in science mm. diplomacy, because at the end, uh, uh, science diplomacy, it's also important to make Europe stronger in the world. And, uh, and uh, that is uh, a key preoccupation for us for the European Commission mm -hmm. and uh, as I mentioned we have uh, highlighted uh, science diplomacy and the need uh, mm -hmm. to have uh, um, an approach which is coordinated in our uh, communication on the global approach which was the object uh, of uh, conclusions from the mm -hmm. EU Council of Ministers and endorsement by the European Parliament and in those conclusions uh, uh, that uh, were adopted in 2021 the Council of Ministers uh, uh, tasked uh, us the European mm -hmm. Commission together with the European External Action Service mm -hmm. to develop a European framework for science mm -hmm. diplomacy. And that is something which is hugely yeah. important. The first it, time something like that happened? It's the first time mm -hmm. that it happened. It was discussed now at uh, ministerial level uh, in Santander in a ministerial conference of competitiveness ministers, mm -hmm. uh, which was organized by the current Spanish presidency of the Council. And uh, on that basis, uh, we are uh, um, preparing the work for what we could recommend for this framework to be and to pick up on your question on your comments uh, we are uh, setting up some dedicated working groups mm -hmm. which include academia which include diplomats policy makers so that we try to to take the broad scope of the mm -hmm. relevant actors in order to define mm -hmm. what could be done to have a more coordinated approach at EU, at EU level on science diplomacy in order to have uh, yeah. more impact. Yeah, yeah. And a continued, sustained approach, Ab absolutely, of course, absolutely. Uh, towards the future, as the Commission will be changing and so on. There will be changes, so let's hope that this is a sustained effort. Uh, but um, yes, I mean, it's an effort to just mm -hmm. to, to, it, it's a thing, uh, an effort that will be, uh, will be continued uh, through a specific instrument that mm -hmm. uh, we would put on the table in order for that not to be just endeavors, but mm -hmm. uh, to really have a path for the future. Yeah. Okay, great. That's good to hear. Uh, JC, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first, I think it's it's great to hear. Uh, indeed, like uh, Professor uh, Van Langenhove s said, there are indeed many challenges in, in science diplomacy. We, we know them. Um, we could focus here indeed on the on the lack of government strategy or government coordination uh, among maybe EU members, but it's it's valid across countries in, in the mm -hmm. world uh, to to deal with uh, issues of, of science and their and their diplomacy, and I think that hinders the the way that states can respond to issues mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, in science of importance, and in turn that hinders our ability mm -hmm. as a whole to deal with pressing uh, scientific issues mm -hmm. uh, globally. Do you mean the scientific community? Are no, I, I mean uh, the world as the a whole world. to be able to mm -hmm. respond because we mm -hmm. uh, states don't necessarily have the right um, mm -hmm. institutions or coordination in place, interfaces in place, and that hinders in turn the way that they may engage with mm -hmm. international organizations and then in turn the way that international organizations deal with mm -hmm. uh, such such issues. So mm -hmm. um, I think that that is one, one challenge that I, that I see that there are many others. Um, Hence the welcome approach also that the yes, Commission absolutely. is taking now, of absolutely. course, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. it, Sounds like this is very important and could be a game changer. It, it would be crucial. I mean, if, if the Commission and the EU is pushing this agenda, mm -hmm. I think states will, will listen and will also mm -hmm. uh, be able to develop these, these strategies and these uh, interfaces that, that are direly needed. So I, I, I totally agree uh, with yeah, and, and welcome what's happening. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay. What about the speed of change? Um, not just for science diplomacy to change, but also the world that we live in. It's been called the Anthropocene, the multipolar world, the global problems we have, uh, the global commons that are hard to get a handle on. Is science diplomacy really fit for purpose? Can it deliver? 
how do you see that? Is it going to, uh, we are on a high now. Well, we are working towards our high. We are gaining momentum. How to sustain it? Can it deliver? Um, yeah, let me ask JC first. Uh, sure. I mean, uh, yes, I think we, we all agree that the, the problems are worsening. They're accelerating. So the pace of change is, is something that is very difficult for our institutions, national and international, to keep up with. Uh, and uh, I don't I don't think we see enough change. I think we're, we're not adapting quickly enough, uh, to be honest. Um, we do have, you know, interfaces um, like um, uh, science advisors to ministries of foreign affairs, science attaches and, and, and counselors and embassies. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, bodies like the uh, Inter Not enough, maybe. Uh, not enough. That's, uh, well, there's never enough, I think, from my perspective. But, um, you know, bodies like the IPCC for climate change mm. and so on. But but it's it's more, uh, it's not the norm. Those are exceptions. Mm. Um, so I, I think we, we need to, to adapt to that pace of change. And to be fair, also our scientific institution, international scientific institutions, mm. uh, are a bit fragmented mm -hmm. and uh, the global voice for for science needs to g gain mm. uh in, in in importance and and uh, uh i think there's a, a big effort from the community the scientific community to actually also uh, step up and, and answer uh, mm -hmm. the, these these challenges and so i think that's exactly why science diplomacy is fit for purpose mm -hmm. um, whether it is a, a different name that eventually takes over or, mm -hmm. or, or not mm -hmm. uh, we I have no choice but to answer these pressing problems. Uh, mm -hmm. It's 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 uh, it's inevitable. Right, yeah. you're nodding fiercely <laughs> at that. Yes, uh, absolutely, go Christina. <laughs> please go ahead. Yeah, no, JC, <laughs> indeed. I mean, uh, I I was really thinking about uh, about that. That the fact is that we don't have to be a kind of captured into a definition of science mm -hmm. diplomacy and then uh, seeing if it is fit for the changing world or for mm -hmm. the geopolitical crisis. I think that uh, what we need to do, and maybe this is a step that uh, we are taking and we want and should be taking, uh, is to is to have uh, a a clear vision of which are the objectives of the science diplomacy mm -hmm. and then be able to uh, to adapt the science diplomacy actions to the needs to which mm -hmm. we are confronted mm -hmm. for example i mean whom would have uh, thought for example when we have uh, prepared and adopted the global approach communication the strategy for international mm -hmm. cooperation that in europe we would be confronted with a war mm -hmm. and we have been we've been mm -hmm. And, uh, and there, I, I take it as an example of science diplomacy, the, the fact that we have been able to react quickly to the Russian illegal invasion of Ukraine with strong support of Ukraine, of course, with uh, finding uh, ways in an innovative and uh, not easy way from a legal point of view of uh, uh, blocking uh, our cooperation with the Russian public institutions, uh, while at the same time trying to have the links uh, with the Russian scientists which mm -hmm. were uh, in the diaspora or not uh, are not really connected with the government and that is uh, i mean uh, we have done it uh, without mm -hmm. uh, saying is it science diplomacy does it fit with the definition no but that was a way to use science in order to tackle uh, a geopolitical uh, um, important uh, quick need and urgency so i think that this is the way in which uh, we mm -hmm. have to think skipping out from a definition but mm -hmm. act absolutely yeah. Yeah, and still, if I may pick up on uh, the war against Ukraine, it was definitely to the detriment of some scientific cooperation, right? Or not? I mean, um, I understand the difficulty there. There comes uh, uh, the difficulty in having diplomacy and international collaboration work, but also the need for individual people, individual projects to still go ahead. And it's very hard to find that balance. Is that so? Yeah, I mean, it's a hard balance to find, uh, but uh, and also you need to to put a line and you never know if mm. the line is the mm. really correct one. Mm. But I mean, mm. taking into account the gravity of the situation, mm -hmm. we need to react. And uh, the political choice that was made by mm. the Commission was to stop the cooperation with all the Russian uh, public yeah. uh, uh, mm -hmm. organizations, uh, which, uh, which uh, yes, of course, uh, was a damage for scientific cooperation because Russia was uh, a, a very important uh, scientific partner for us. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, we have uh, uh, done the utmost in order to 
try to uh, maintain the link uh, with uh, uh, the scientists at uh, individual level and also we had a specific project for example to support the scientific mm -hmm. diaspora in uh, in mm -hmm. in Europe but uh, indeed uh, it's there are there are not the easy choices that uh, in this mm -hmm. situation in this no. uh, in this context uh, but the gravity of the situation calls uh, for some uh, uh, clear cut positions yeah, yeah. there yeah yeah in in a way we had to wake up and be real also perhaps also the um yeah getting rid of the romantic notion of what uh, science uh, scientific diplomacy is uh, what we were talking about earlier we clearly live in a different world also, if you look at uh, Ms. Ursula von der Leyen's uh, State of the Union uh, a few days ago, strategic and autonomy, uh, we need not to be naive. We need to also put lines in the sand of what we stand for. And that's, I think, only going to be more and more important, which... Oh, OK. I was going to ask Christina to sort of talk more about uh, Please, what's uh, a European Commission. <laughs> but I see, JC, you are eager to add something no, to No, no. I mean, this is... I uh, don't mean to interrupt, but I, I, I think um, indeed it's a very you know, difficult balance uh, between the political, the diplomatic mm -hmm. and, and, and science and global science. Um, but I think, um, you know, there needs to be uh, engagement and consultation always between the scientists and the policymakers mm -hmm. when such, such decisions are taken, because it mm -hmm. can have uh, consequences that are unintended um, mm. in, in terms of uh, scientific collaboration. So we need to be careful also and really strike a, a balance between uh, what is necessary from a political and diplomatic standpoint and also uh, what is necessary to maintain uh, mm -hmm. global science going forward. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, a careful consultation with, with scientists um, in, in the EU and every country that would be affected would, would be something that is, is necessary. But it's, it's a very difficult uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. balance. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Perhaps it will come back in the, the next question after Christina, because we'll talk more about universities and how they, uh, universities and academics mm. at universities, you know, individually and institutionally, what is mm. required. But first, uh, Christina, I wanted to ask you, um, indeed, as you've said already, um, there's been quite a few uh, initiatives already and there are more coming. Can you give us a little bit more insight into what is uh, coming on science diplomacy from the European Commission yes, and the yes, institutions, sir. the interaction also with yeah. the other institutions, if you can? Yes, of course I will do. But just I want to pick up on what you said when you refer to our president, Mrs. van der Leyen's mm -hmm. speech of the State of the Union. Uh, is that uh, indeed uh, this, uh, this approach of, uh, of uh, not being naive also mm. in our international cooperation. And uh, I would like to say that uh, this is exactly what uh, we have promoted with our global approach to research mm. innovation, where uh, we have really put forward our values and principles, mm. including then science diplomacy. But at the same time, we have uh, uh, set up some specific safeguards uh, which uh, we can use and we've been using in our framework program mm -hmm. in order to stop the cooperation uh, where mm -hmm. it is detrimental to the European mm. such as? interest. Such as? for example, um, what uh, we call the Article 22.5 and 22.6 of the Horizon Europe regulation. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to be too technical, but they allow to, let's say, close some sensitive uh, mm -hmm. uh, areas to a cooperate to participation of their countries, uh, mm -hmm. uh, like quantum, like uh, space. Yeah. Or, for example, uh, um, there, are, there is another, the, other art the, uh, the same article, there is another provision that allows us uh, to um, exclude uh, uh, research entities uh, from uh, a third country uh, in uh, some specific actions, uh, and we did it for innovation mm -hmm. actions, uh, if uh, we think that participation of these uh, entities, mm -hmm. uh, in that case they were entities from China, would mm -hmm. be detrimental to the European interest. And yeah. why did we do that? Because we are discussing an EU-China roadmap on science mm -hmm. and technology. And while we have advanced on uh, the framework conditions for cooperation in research, we have not done it on innovation. So we have taken this measure. Mm 
it's a bit of a parenthesis, but I think it's it's important because uh, um, we we I, what I want to say is that uh, with with, the, with our policy, international cooperation policy in research innovation, we are open, we are forthcoming, but we are also looking at the yeah. EU's interest. Mm -hmm. To your question, I, I took some time to say <laughs> to, <laughs> to to to, the, to 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 say something else, so I will be brief. Yes, I mean we we as I mentioned, we are working hand in hand with the Council of Ministers mm -hmm. and with the European Parliament. And now, after this uh, ministerial discussion that uh, took place in July, we are setting up um, five working groups that uh, look mm. at the way of uh, uh, of uh, have uh, a, a real European science diplomacy agenda, which uh, aims at having more impact, which aims at making a more strategic use of scientific evidence and foresight, which aims also at fostering cooperation between science mm. scientists and diplomats, mm -hmm. especially in the EU embassies um, outside outside Europe. And uh, we are planning to wrap up the result of the work of these uh, working groups, uh, hopefully by the end of the year. These working groups are going to be launched mm. in those days. And uh, uh, based on that, we will, um, we will come out with specific recommendations for further action. I don't know yet uh, if there is going to be a formal uh, EU document mm. uh, such as a recommendation or if there will be some guidelines. This will be, mm -hmm. uh, will be decided after we have, in fact, consulted our experts. Uh, and let me say again, experts mm. from different mm. member states, but uh, from universities, from uh, the mm. foreign uh, affairs, so trying to reach out as broadly as possible. Mm. Okay, working groups with a tall order, five uh, different topics and so on. Uh, there's a lot coming. Uh, and what do you, what do you, what can you add to that, uh, JC, in terms of the academic perspectives? What do the universities bring to the table? But also, what do they need from actors like the European Commission? Yeah. Well, uh, first. Uh it's it's wonderful news. It's fantastic that uh, this is moving forward. I think this is uh, really just what we need, actually. Um, and uh, you, you know, trying to understand, mm. uh, get the two communities that are mm. uh, you know fairly siloed, to be honest, uh, diplomats and 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 academics, uh, mm. scientists, uh, together. Um, on an agenda also to sort of co-produce what research is needed to understand what is needed so mm -hmm. that our institutions are more efficient, uh, that we can solve problems faster when it comes to science. I think it's exactly what we need. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think uh, if, if you allow me to, to, to maybe say a few challenges about the, 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 the field uh, from an academic and, and research mm -hmm. perspective at, at university, um, I think you know science diplomacy is still a bit underdeveloped. Uh, it, it has a small community of researchers. Mm. Um, that's because the field is fairly new. Um, it it has limited offerings at universities as well mm. in terms of education. Mm. Does your university um, offer a course? Yes, 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 uh, yes. My, my department and myself <laughs> are <laughs> very happy to uh, to, to uh, you're leading the way to then. offer uh, a science diplomacy course at uh, at the master's level. Uh, indeed. Um, but yes, the, the, the field is also, uh, given the, the diversity uh, of the issues at stake, is, is deeply interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that can be a problem to find a department home, uh, to, yeah. to, to find research funding that is targeted at you mm -hmm. know, science diplomacy or science policy or global science policy issues. Um, so I, I think those are, are some of the issues that are uh, faced by, by uh, academics like, like mm -hmm. myself uh, at, at universities. Yeah. The silos so, also exist at universities. Mm -hmm. They do, they do. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, you know, in science diplomacy, a lot uh, of researchers have been coming at science diplomacy from their own disciplinary lens, which mm -hmm. has been very useful to uh, to really get uh, you know different uh, ways of thinking, different different ways of looking uh, at things, which is very rich. But at the mm. same time, I think now is the time where we really truly need to bring all the disciplines that we need together mm -hmm. to tackle the problem collaboratively mm -hmm. uh, at uh, at the university mm -hmm. level. So we are forming groups like, like mm. the European Science Diplomacy Alliance has been formed, and so on, so on. And we need the interface with the yeah. policy making world and the diplomats to mm -hmm. really talk together mm -hmm. and really address these problems in an interdisciplinary way.
Mm-hmm. I would like yeah. to add something mm-hmm. here. Uh, Please, go yes. ahead. You, you mentioned uh, the, the, the question of the, dis- the availability of funds and the European Science Diplomacy Alliance. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me say that uh, this alliance was built up uh, on the basis of three science diplomacy mm-hmm. projects uh, which were funded uh, under the European Union Research Innovation Framework Programme under Horizon 2020 and uh, that then gave birth to this uh, European Absolutely. alliance. So just yes. uh, to say that, I mean, uh, we, are, we have been also very keen in the European Commission, uh, not just to provide a policy framework, but also to provide funding mm-hmm. to our uh, researchers uh, mm-hmm. in order to develop, uh, further develop science diplomacy. And we are very mm-hmm. happy that uh, this resulted uh, in this uh, European Science Diplomacy Academy. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, sometimes, you know, I don't want to minimize it by saying it's seed money or it's a little money, but it's a, con- it's a substantial amount of money, but it can turn into a bigger uh, project and bigger results if others also then also latch on and uh, the results and the impact are, are, are multiplied, I think. Uh, so uh, that sounds good for the future also in terms of the alliance. Yeah, and in this case, if I must, may, may add, the, the good thing was that uh, the projects then converged towards this alliance. So there mm-hmm. was uh, there was uh, this uh, synergy that uh, was really a, a very, very Im- important uh, result mm-hmm. of, this, yes. of these projects. Instead of going separated, no, mm-hmm. converging, going together in order to have a bigger impact. That's uh, what uh, is... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I agree. And this, this was immensely helpful, mm-hmm. these uh, EU-funded uh, projects. Mm-hmm. And um, I think, you know, at the national level, where well, you know, university mm. also operates through national funding, I think there is a, a bit of a, a still a gap in terms of the funding institutions that are willing to uh, fund these kinds of research nationally. Mm. Uh, and I think you know, this EU action um, will hopefully shine a light on on that further, and then nations will hopefully devote a bit more funding to to the uh, to, to that kind of research. I mean, this is my this is my hope. That reminds me of the need for new generations of researchers, of uh, students, and so on, to um, yeah, to, to to develop the area. Yeah, I think we were talking about silos right er- mm-hmm. earlier, and so I, I think there are professional silos at the moment between. Uh, say, current scientists and current diplomats that exist because they are siloed through their own educational track and the, the way that they then go into their professional lives. And we need to, to uh, reduce these, these uh, silos. But also the new generation. Uh, I think we need to birth a new generation of, of uh, scholars and practitioners that are from a young age, um, at the bachelor level, master's level, already attuned to issues of science and issues of international relations, mm-hmm. and that can straddle both worlds. Um, I really strongly believe that uh, we, we need those individuals to, to really understand both aspects mm-hmm. because that is what the world needs, I believe. Lots of dreams, lots of plans. I think this is the end of our conversation. It's been very uh, insightful. I would say thank you to our guests, our authentic guests, for uh, giving us your time and your insight. It has been a lively discussion for sure with useful insights on science diplomacy. Clearly, universities and policymakers have much to learn from each other on the issue, and we have reason to be optimistic about the emerging, potentially vital role for science diplomacy. But we need to be strategic, we need to be targeted, we need to be concrete, uh, we need not to be naive, we need interfaces, we need to co-create, we need to engage with many different stakeholders. So. To our viewers, I would say also, thanks for watching. Do not hesitate to leave comments via the Liru YouTube channel or on LinkedIn or on X. And do stay tuned for the next Liru Talks.